Thank you everyone uh, for joining today. My name is Robert Ficalia, uh, and we're gonna talk about some AI controls and how you can wrap some policy and code, policy as code and some automation around those. One thing you will note, I am not actually three separate people. <laughs> My collaborators from IBM uh, had travel issues and were not able to attend. Uh, we have some recordings that they were kind enough to put together. We'll give that a try, and if that doesn't work, then we'll just abort and I'll walk through the rest of this, their slides. But uh, I wanted to kind of contextualize why we're here. For those of you, first of all, just a quick show of hands. How many are using AI in production today in some use case? Couple, couple. How many have been asked to do some sort of AI assessment or risk assessment or anything like that? Okay, so kind of the same, maybe even a few more than are in production. So, you know, why are people asking for this? I think any time in, in society when you have some, you know, wonderful new thing, uh, there's a lot of mystery and a lot of confusion at, at all layers about what this is and how do we predict it and how do we control it. You know, you know, ancient peoples tried to ground their truths in something that they could objectively all collectively see and share. Um, so maybe it was the planets or the stars or the positions of moons. And then they might try to use that to relate it more complex societal issues like who's going to win a battle or who's going to be the next king, right? And if your grounding truth, i.e. the observable planets and stars, continued to work as promised, even if you got something wrong on the battle or the king dropped dead un unexpectedly, you kind of blame the framework and not your individual prediction, right? So it might, might be a nice uh, scapegoat to save your job. So I think we're, we're kind of facing similar uh, paradigm today as C-suite folks, as regulators, as lawmakers wrestle with, you know, what is AI risk? How do we get our heads around it? What should we allow? What, where should we be worried? There's this notion of establishing trust. So if we can build a model and a framework around things that we know, rules and lists, uh, measurable things, things that we can kind of touch and feel, then we feel much more grounded and, and it's trustworthy. And as security practitioners, you know, we know things like threat modeling. We know things like security controls. We know security frameworks like NIST 853. So that gives us our, our grounding in a known truth that we can then try to extrapolate to this new reality and how we control and use AI responsibly. Um, so the shared language gives us an ability to discuss and agree about what we're all talking about. You know, let's all agree on a set of best guesses for how we can apply these rules or controls and what they are to any particular system that we're working on or designing. And then now we can start to count things. We can start to measure things. We can talk about depth and coverage and breadth and the impact. Um, you know, we can even maybe model time between failures or, or uh, you know, biases or things like that. Um, and then we can start to test these controls. Now that we have a shared language and a shared understanding and a, maybe a measurement framework, how do we measure the desired state to the actual state, the desired performance to the actual performance? And as a security mindset, we can start to look at it from the attacker's perspective and see how they're going to probe the system and try to perturb that desired state. Um, and, and then once we are in some sort of incident, we can start to talk about how do we contain that incident? How do we even assess damage? What does that look like? And what does incident response and mitigation and remediation look like? So again, all these very familiar frameworks, we can take all of those conceptual models and apply those to AI, not necessarily because it's the best tool, but it's the tool we have right now as we all kind of develop a, a better practitioner view of AI. Um, you know, we have threat models and uh, you know, MITRE attack and things today, so no surprise, these have popped up already for trying to model uh, AI risks. Uh, MITRE Atlas and other frameworks have attempted to do this. Um, the problem is, if you're not an AI practitioner, trying to model those higher level concepts to specific parts of your model training, your data curation, or your feature selection, let alone your pipelines for deploying and, and gating and then testing and getting feedback, it, it starts to become very complex and unwieldy. Um, to help with that, Linux Foundation, uh, as well as NIST, has published a set of AI-specific controls, and they try to take more of an activity-based approach, because again, they don't really know uh, what the right best practice and patterns are. This is evolving so quickly. 
let's take an activity stream approach of things that we know we can do with a set of goals that we can align and agree, uh, align our activities toward and agree upon, at least that's a starting point. Um, today, I'll, I'll be focusing in the limited time on you know, more of the security and privacy, but obviously there are concerns. And I, I talk about one use case in this talk in healthcare. There are lots of different concerns that span beyond just security of the data, security of the pipeline, security of the AI, and the model. There's fairness, bias. If you're talking about healthcare, you're worried about socioeconomic bias in your populations, harms that the hallucinations or predictions might cause physically, medically. So it, both the non-medical and the medical frameworks do encompass a lot more than just the hard security, you know, kind of the CIA triad, the confidentiality, the integrity, the availability. They're, they're now more focused on these AI-specific human use case scenario things. Um, the NIST RMF approach is really to um, you know, measure, manage, govern across all these different concerns around bias and security, privacy, and kind of take a, a workflow approach that you know, slices up your activities and your checkpoints over time. Um, it's a good starting point. You know, it's kind of high level as you start to sift through. We'll, we'll go through some examples um, with our virtual Anka and Vikas. And uh, they'll walk you through how we've done some of that mapping. I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples uh, in the healthcare space. Um, so for security and privacy, which is where I'm focused, you know, I, I tend to think of you know, AI models themselves are really kind of compressed data, right? So everything we're talking about is, is data protection at, at a security level. There are all sorts of supply chain risks, uh, the you know, development stack tooling, the CI/CD pipelines, the application themselves, all of those are definitely important in the context of an AI-enabled app application. But I think those have been covered well in other frameworks, NIST 853, um, CSA, all these other things. So if you just suspend that concern and just call that, you know, we're dealing with AI data and all those other controls apply, for today we can focus on kind of the unique AI security and privacy. And so in, in trying to threat model just those narrower slices, um, you can look at things like Stride. Um, and you know, some of those concepts do map, but it focuses more on things like authentication, authorization, kind of has a kind of a network or host-based perspective versus these kind of nuanced AI and data risks. You know, how does Stride apply necessarily to bias and safety concerns or privacy concerns per se, other than the, again, the CIA concerns? So I, I was looking for a couple of different options for threat modeling. Um, in one of the other uh, Kubernetes SIG security groups I participate in, we're undergoing the Kubernetes threat modeling exercise, and we kind of came up with a, a slightly uh, new model for organizing these concepts, organized around assumptions, threat vectors, and of course, trust boundaries, which, which is very stridy. Um, but kind of enumerating those assumptions beyond just component configurations or you know, private keys or, or you know, certain uh, technical details, but more around the human and the behavior of the system. So the assumption part, I kind of kept into my, my threat modeling. And then this notion of threat vectors, yes, you have actors. Actors are acting upon some resource, whether it's a kube cluster or if it's some, you know, some CI CD pipeline. But I wanted to actually capture the more mathematical sense of a vector that has kind of direction and a scale or you know, magnitude. Because I think in, in discussing AI risk with stakeholders, you really have to start to put real numbers to it. When, when it's AI, again, is already so foreign to a lot of the stakeholders. If you can ground your risk model in actual numbers, and of course the most important number could be financial loss or financial risk, now they can start to understand the motivation behind trying to threat model this to protect yourself from harm in a financial sense. So I, I, we do um, walk through some examples of that. So I, I coined a, a new name for my model, AVG AI, a very good AI. It's kind of my mnemonic. But again, it's that assumptions, the vectors, the, what I'll call the goals of the AI. And then the AI part is you know, we want an 
actual impact measure. We want to be able to measure that numerically. Um, I'll, I'll talk about how I kind of map those to specific things, and I'll call out again that NIST RMF has a great little web tool. Um, you can Google it, and they have a playbook that you can filter and slice through their control requirements, and then the different subselections, and it really gets you to uh, a very small definition of the control you're trying to map, and that, you know, that helped us pick a particular grounding definition from NIST AI RMF and then map it to this AV, uh, AVG AI threat model. Um, I just want to take a quick aside, and I know there was another AI event uh, here as well, but the notion of red teaming is very important. It got a lot of um, visibility because of uh, the U.S. executive order requirements and, and uh, agencies who have put some emphasis on this. I, I would say that as part of a control structure, it's, you know, it's a control requirement for some frameworks in security in the state of 53, Rev 5, you do red teaming. I would say that um, it's also a control you should consider for your AI program, your training and your generative AI especially. Um, I'm not gonna go into gory details of how you do that, but I would call out that as we've been doing this in practice, uh, handcrafting LLM prompting has, has not scaled very well. Um, and you can read research, uh, there's some open source. You can now generate your LLM red teaming prompts automatically, and then from there you can, you can handcraft and tune and tweak and try to probe. But de definitely kind of building up a generated set of LLM prompts for your red teaming so that you can try to either jailbreak the model, get data out that you shouldn't be able to, get it to uh, ignore its rules about safety and harm and, and you know, hate speech and things like that. Um, having that corpus of, of adversarial prompts that's generated automatically helps, and you can build a pipeline around that. I think it's a little early for a full, truly policy as code uh, implementation of that, but at least you have the ability to insert that into your, um, your sprints, if you will. So let me talk about a, a real world system where we applied some of these approaches. Uh, it's a collaborative uh, healthcare environment where you've got different, sometimes competing medical provider institutions or entities who want to do training on a shared set of data. I uh, sorry, uh, want to do shared model training but on their own separate data sources without having to share everybody's data together in one you know, data lake that everybody has to merge and get privacy and HIPAA approvals. So we did, uh, using a combination of uh, Google and AWS infrastructure, we did kind of a federated learning environment where everybody could encrypt their own data, do training, partial training on the model, and then the results would eventually get combined together and everybody got the final trained model, but nobody else got to see everybody else's data, if that makes sense. So the, the kind of concerns we were focused on is that, you know, just to highlight a few, I, as an institution, don't want to share my data, so if I'm training something, I don't want that data to somehow leak out of the model through, again, some of these red teaming attacks or just carelessness through the, the process of this federated learning. Um, there was a unique, just to highlight, that some of these AI concerns are not really strictly IT security related. Um, they're almost economic model related about who, what is the value of the data I have and what is the perceived value of the result of the AI training? How am I gonna monetize that or, or maybe it's for social well-being? What is the outcome? Maybe it's for my reputation. One of the things that we learned in the process of, of dealing with these institutions is their reputation in the community is probably the most important thing. Um, so they didn't wanna have, they didn't wanna seed ground perhaps to another institution as being kind of the premier research institution. So. There was a concern, um, theoretical, that you know, some institutions might try to be free riders and contribute less data than everyone else. So we had to kind of model out that type of a, a, an a omission attack. I don't want to give you all of my data. At the same time, um, there's an economic theory, uh, some of you might be familiar with, uh, where it's the, the bad money chases out the good, um, has to do with debasing currency, but kind of the notion of the lemon laws of you know, used cars, if, if all the used cars were bad, right, that's all you'd get. 
So we wanted to prevent lemons in the data. We wanted to prevent people from kind of just submitting their bad data and saying, look, I submitted you know, a terabyte of data to this federated learning model, and I expect to get all the benefits accrued to my center. And they're just kind of giving us dirty uh, data or not useful data, duplicative data. And again, because everything is encrypted and we can't you know, break the encryption and see it, we really didn't have a way to know. So we had to devise some metrics that we could apply to that. And I'll show you how we implemented that as policy as code. Um, a couple, and then the, the V part is we wanted to make sure that we understood who the actors were in both the federated learning training and then our role is kind of infrastructure and collaborative uh, enablement through the encryption mechanisms and all of the Kubernetes infrastructure, et cetera. Um, and we wanted to make sure that there were no supply chain vulnerabilities introduced by the trusted party. Um, yeah, and we had, we had defined our goals, and, and also the C-suite folks who had to approve this, especially the compliance and legal, loved that we were giving them actual measures so that we could calculate a financial loss for some of these scenarios that they could get their heads wrapped around and put into the, you know, into the spreadsheets to approve. Um, so this is probably too dense to see here. I'll, I'll post the slides, but essentially we enumerate all of our assumptions. And so we've, we built a graph database of all the actors, all their goals, all their uh, you know, financial rewards, and then we kind of enumerated all the ways they might be able to cheat, all the ways that we as kind of the trusted party might be able to mess up, <laughs> and then we, we had our assumption list. And then we mapped that to you know, our, our vector space, so what, how frequently were things being done, what, you know, how could we measure quality, how could we quantify, the amount of contribution and the kind of benefits accrued, and then you know how we could provide a valuation function that didn't require us to see all the data, but could objectively measure what everybody's contribution or rewards should be. Um, and of course, everybody's shared goal was to maximize the value of that collaboratively trained model. Um, they might want to minimize their data contribution explicitly as a goal. Um, they may still perceive it, even though there were strong encryption and privacy guarantees and all of this modeling, their institution may perceive this still as a risk. And so, yes, we'll prove it, but we just want you to contribute the absolute least you necessarily need to. Um, yeah, and then we want no individual participant wanted to ruin it for themselves, right? So if they were going to try to cheat or they were trying to walk this fine line that their institution had set, they wanted to contribute enough so that they, you know, the model, uh, the federated learning model worked. And if they were cheating, they, they wanted to break it only just a little bit and get those benefits, but not break it for everybody, including themselves. Um, so we, we actually created kind of the key insight for how we would operationalize this threat model and build policy around. We actually built uh, a game model, those of you who might be familiar with cryptography or cryptanalysis. It's kind of a common pattern. Um, and we use a, kind of an economic uh, you know, game theory game, Vickery, Clark, Groves, or VCG. But it basically derived from an auction concept where you know, everybody kind of bids what their value of the good is. And then you, know, you get kind of a split of everybody else's bid. So it allows us to formally model the threat, formally model the payoff that each participant would get, and quantify that as kind of a penalty, a reward for participating fairly, or a penalty if you cheated. So and we could model that and sum that up to um, all the participants. Again, this was, the cheating was theoretical, so what we wanted to show to them that their interests were protected, and that by making this transparent to everybody, we would you know, pre prevent anyone from even being tempted from cheating, and it was, you know, a cogent way to explain to folks, in, especially in these compliance and risk groups, that there was really no incentive for anyone to cheat. Um, and then we wrap this in, if those of you are familiar with Open Policy Agent, um, we ejected Open Policy Agent in a couple of different places in uh, this federated training infrastructure. And as things were being trained, there's a simplified version of it, um, but we would get the input from the CI CD step that would do an assessment on the fairness, the amount of data that, that was contributed, and our you know, proxy metric for the quality. 
it would compute the various strategies that we could uh, apply to those contributions and try to derive, you know, what is the score? We think it's, you know, this was a fair player, they were, or they contributed bad data, or they contributed partial data. And then the actual output, I hope you can see that, but the actual output was a dollar amount, like a penalty amount, um, if they were you know, caught cheating, or a more positive reward if they were actually contributing fairly and high quality data. And so we use that as part of our continuous policy as code regime to make sure that as training uh, iterations occurred, we could make sure that we were within tolerances, right? Um, and in, in the event, you know, we never detected any cheating and continue not to detect any cheating. But I think that visibility that everybody knows that kind of somebody's watching <laughs> would prevent it. Now on the supply chain side, I, I, there are lots of other talks on SBOM risks and, and using OPA and other you know, gate, uh, gating policy engines to scan your images and admission control and things. So I'll, I'll skip all that, but that's the underlying substrate for all these pipelines and federated learning and Kubeflow and such was you know, th those same type of uh, policy as code gateway. Um, so at this point, I'm gonna try to switch over to my collaborative, <laughs> virtual collaborators here, and we'll see if this works. I did some testing. They were kind enough to provide recording. Let's see if it actually plays. Okay, so as Robert mentioned in the previous slide, uh, that the NIST AI RMS set of controls are divided into four categories. And here we explicitly look at the managed category. The controls as, uh, in, in the managed category are more technical in nature, and these are the set of controls that can be automated by implementing the checks uh, in, in different uh, policy validation points. The managed category is also further subdivided into subcategories. So for example, we have a category where uh, it asks to deploy mechanism uh, so that the sustained value of the deployed AI system can be checked. Um, uh, another subcategory is on uh, monitoring the, uh, regularly monitoring the AI systems and model for maintenance. Uh, and another subcategory is on basically post-deployment uh, mon uh, monitoring plans to ensure that uh, we are capturing and evaluating the input from the user. Uh, and in each of these subcategories, we have uh, one or more controls. So for example, uh, the first control in the uh, AI value uh, proposition is basically we need to filter the output from the generative AI for any harmful or biased content, or if there is any misinformation, so we have to detect that and filter those content out. Uh, for the post-deployment, we have controls to evaluate the uh, sentiments of the output from uh, user studies and, uh, and work with in collaboration with the AI uh, actors and uh, users who are uh, have research experience to figure out whether the AI model is performing as expected or not. Uh, there's also a control to uh, detect and filter the uh, uh, data um, uh, out which contains either inappropriate or harmful or toxic content so that these uh, don't go as part of the training process. And next, what we will see is um, uh, how these catalogs and controls can be um, uh, implemented or uh, specified in a machine-readable format. Okay, over to you, Anka. Thank you, thank you, Vikas. Um, so we have all seen these uh, uh, regulations, standards, or organizational policies that uh, typically come in PDF format or spreadsheet, uh, which are difficult to um, uh, use, right, in a programmatic context. So uh, by treating the uh, these uh, documents as um, YAML or XML or JSON. Um, we set the basis for uh, being able to manage this information as code. So in the next slide, we can see for the catalogs level, uh, looking at the control as the um, element uh, 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 entity, core element entity of a catalog and representing it with all its uh, properties and parameters um, in, in a programmatic way, we can uh, thus represent those catalogs in a programmatic format. In uh, the... Uh, compliance as code standard provided by NIST, the National Institute of Standard and Technology, there are three data models, three artifacts, uh, three schemas associated with this level of uh, compliance, the catalog level of compliance. The catalogs themselves, which is the complete uh, suite of controls associated with a, with a regulation or with a law, with a standard. We have the second one being the profile or the baseline, which is a subset of those controls that uh, represent that baseline with the associated parameter values. So for instance, in the case of the NIST 850C or FedRAMP, we have three baselines, low, moderate, and high, uh, with more and more controls as we uh, get more stringent and with uh, uh, more stringent values as we go from low to high. And the third um, artifact is the crosswalks mappings that um, map uh, catalogs or uh, profiles from different regulations to show how they relate to each other. And uh, this is very important in case of uh, reuse of evidence and posture rather than treating the 
new program uh, from scratch in an environment, we can start by using through those mappings the existing uh, evidence and posture already um, uh, covered by, by the existing regulations in place. So um, with this level of detail of the high level uh, control uh, English level of the um, regulation, it is very difficult to reach automation. So in order to bring this closer to technology, um, in the next slide, we show how these controls are uh, uh, split uh, at technology level in rules that actually reflect how the particular control is implemented in a technology versus another. So we have here two examples um, on the uh, left column and middle column. Uh, we show uh, left the NIST 853 example of the SE7 applied for network security with three different services, the cloud object storage, uh, Kubernetes, and uh, VPC load balancer and service. And we show that the requirement for boundary protection in each case is implemented by limiting the type of endpoints for cloud object storage or by uh, leveraging a particular type of technology for the uh, ingress nodes. Um, so these uh, rules then are uh, more suitable to be checked and, and automated. On the middle column, we see an example of the NIST IRMF uh, for model serving and monitoring. So as Vikas uh, presented um, in the uh, slide before is that in this in the context of these controls, we want to validate the level of bias of harmful harmful content um, and uh, misinformation. So those rules can have uh, can be checked against certain thresholds, and as the baseline is more or less stringent, that the, those values will increase or decrease. In the compliance uh, as code standard, those called from NIST, the uh, this mapping between the technology, the the components, and the uh, controls is declared in the component definition artifact. And um, the, the type of components are not only services or software, can also be processes, procedures, or hardware. Whatever the, um, implements the control that is in that particular uh, standard or, or uh, regulation. Another artifact that we have in, uh, in the NIST compliance code OSCAL is the system security plan. The content is very similar to the component definition. It's just a reflection of an actual environment. So a component definition suite can um, provide the mapping of the uh, technology of those uh, services or software or processes to the controls for every available uh, software or service um, in a cloud provider. In the system security plan, that would be limited only to those uh, components, uh, resources that are actually instantiated by the client, by the customer in their particular environment. Um, and um, to actually infer the posture of the controls, as I mentioned, going through the level of the rules so that we have um, a way to actually validate the content, we can go to the next slide and um, where we now have checks associated with the technology-specific rule, rules. The, these uh, checks are typically provided by policy validation points. There are different types of policy engines. Um, the, we give here two uh, examples, one for an imperative uh, type of engine. Um, we uh, see Ansible playbooks as such an example, or in the open source, we have the audit tree that implements those checks in, in Python. Uh, and on the middle um, column, I give an example for um, declarative code. And uh, OPA, the open policy engine, is an example of such, uh, such engine. Um, if we are looking to more specialized a policy engine, like in the context of Kubernetes, right? We can have Kiverno OPA again as uh, OPA gatekeeper as uh, specialized uh, declarative policy engines. So those the the way that those checks function is that we collect evidence from the environment. Of course, evidence is specific native to the technology that we are using. So as you can see on the left column, right, it's not part of the uh, suite of artifacts that compliance as code provides. And um, the policy uh, validates uh, the actual state, right, evidence against the desired state that is expressed in the rule. And this result can now be standardized. And this is the linkage that we have between the to bridge, right, between the PVP, the policy validation points, and the uh, compliance administration center, having those results in a standard format provided by, by the NIST compliance as code OSCAL standard, so that we now can have meaningful aggregations and insights, right, across normalized results. However, the code itself for the policy uh, checks is not part of the of the standard, right? It's uh, the language used in policy as code, as I mentioned, can be JavaScript, can be Python, can be right, declarative YAML, while the um, yellow part of the compliance as code is um, uh, standardized under the NIST um, uh, specification. Um, so there are, we can see here with the arrows, the three major GRC parts of, uh, of uh, a system that, that implements or uh, leverages this type of um, 
programmatic artifacts. The yellow part is the compliance aspect. The blue part where we um, split the high-level English uh, control to the technology level, right, is the compliance governance. And then as part of the results, we can also evaluate the risk and um, the um, suite of uh, artifacts uh, from the compliances code are, are part of the package that uh, can be leveraged for getting the... Are you on mute? Sorry. So thanks, Anka. So as Anka mentioned in the previous slide, right, uh, we need a set of tools to really manage. I think just based on time, <laughs> I am going to have to walk through, I think, the rest of the slides a little bit more quickly. Uh, so let me make sure that we cover all of them. Uh, Anka explained kind of the OSCAL stack. Um, there's a, we're going to, as part of the uh, TAG compliance work group, we're going to post all these artifacts into the repo, and I put a QR code at the end. And so, you know, at the end of the day, with this OSCAL that this generates is a machine-readable format of all of these controls that have been implemented mapped to those AI RMF um, definitions. And then the OPA or other policy engine rules can be addressed by ID. Um, and there's even embeddings that you could, you could embed. Uh, there's some folks who have built out Kubernetes rules into the OSCAL itself. Um, and again, so the way you can manage this at a simple level, you can do spreadsheet operations. You can keep your component definitions, which include the AI models, the AI data pipelines, et cetera, as spreadsheet rows, and then import that into the Trestle tool, which is an open source OSCAL stack. Um, so that way you can do generative, you know, we're kind of round trip engineering of all of this machine readable YAML or JSON. Um, so I'll skip through some of it. We have a, a PR that we'll put into the main tag security repo, but Vikas put some uh, concrete catalog examples for the AI RMF and all the uh, YAML uh, output that, and JSON output that he showed. Um, and then we're going to be curating uh, AI specific and others, Kubernetes and other uh, CNCF project component definitions. So um, in addition to that, they have uh, provided um, a GitHub uh, project template. So uh, the Trestle uh, IBM folks have put together pipelines that you can use Trestle today to you know, clone the GitHub uh, template and then you have the GitHub actions to take those uh, spreadsheet CSV files and generate automatically on every PR the OSCAL output. So uh, those are linked uh, on the Trestle open source site, but they'll also be linked at the compliance work group as part of our ongoing uh, work. And I'll just note that the TAG uh, working group for compliance has a, a emphasis on, or at least a track on doing AI risk management and control definition, including the OSCAL. So um, we're going to try to produce more best practice information, more examples. I'm going to be contributing more about the federated uh, learning issues that we continue to encounter. It's kind of its own niche area. Um, but again, mapping that back to the AI RMF and that CHI healthcare specific framework. Uh, and again, while well, we'll be doing uh, more LLM specific red teaming discussions and you know, a call out to everyone who might want to participate, we'll do kind of bird of, birds of a feather sessions and maybe even try to organize for this time next year some sort of you know, uh, capture the flag or red teaming exercise live. That's one of our audacious goals. Um, and then this is the uh, TAG compliance working group repo, um, which is this, the QR code. So again, we'll, we'll put all of the information we've presented there and, and more as we evolve it over the next year. So I think we have a couple minutes for questions, if there are anybody. Happy to take those. And if you had questions about the, the content that was on the video or that I had to rush through, I'm happy to stay and talk a little bit more about the OSCAL and the uh, pipeline, uh, GitHub pipeline actions as well. So any questions, either about what we presented or about your own AI risk assessment processes? Yes. Um, not any that I know of, <laughs> other than if there are people that are attending the compliance work group um, who are also in that AI work group, but we'd love to get that resolved. Let's uh, cross-pollinate and make sure that 
uh, we're collaborating appropriately. And if the right home for some of this AI work is really in the AI working group, we're, we're agnostic as to where the effort goes. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, I think we're just about at time. So thank you everyone for your attention and hopefully some useful ideas there.